I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. On this edition of Parallax Views. In 1965 and 66, massacres occurred in Indonesia. It was a coup, a changing of the guard, that saw an overnight shift in regards to those who held power within Indonesia's leadership. And it was all supported by movers and shakers in Washington, D.C. Many questions linger regarding the Indonesian massacres. What does it all mean? Vincent Bevins, author of the stunning new book, The Jakarta Method, Washington's anti-communist Crusade, and the mass murder program that shaped our world doesn't necessarily provide all the answers in a neat little package, but his investigation should shake anyone who reads it to their core and have them rethinking 20th century history and the world we have inherited from that century. Bevins, who has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, and the Los Angeles Times, joins us to discuss this important new book. And I believe that it is really an understatement to even say important This is a book you need to read. In my view, it will be one of the best books, if not the best book, on historical matters to be published in 2020. It is a story of the Cold War, the CIA, the Third World, and horrors of an unspeakable nature. The full picture of what Vincent Bevins calls the Jakarta Method still eludes us to this very day. But the pieces of the puzzle which we have obtained raise startling questions. So with that being said, let's get right into the conversation with Vincent Bevins, author of The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade, and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World. But first, a word from our sponsor. My name is Joseph L. Flatley, and I'm a journalist who specializes in conspiracy theories and French culture. Over the years, I've met cultists and occultists, flat earthers, and doomsday bunker salesmen, to name only a few. One thing I hear often is that the end of the world is near, and these days, you have to wonder if there might be some truth to that. My new podcast is called Failed State Update. Through interviews and original reporting, Each episode asks the question, is the world ending, or does it just seem like it is? Think of it as fresh air for the Orwellian dystopia we've suddenly found ourselves in. Available now on iTunes, Spotify, Anchor, and wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Parallax Views. 
Vincent Bevins, author of the new book. I've been very excited about this book for quite a few months now. The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World. That is a mouthful for a title. Vincent, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, how are you? Thanks for thanks for having me. Pretty good, pretty good. I, I want to really dive into the meat of this book. Uh, but first, if we could, I wanted to talk a little bit about Brazil, which comes up a lot in this book. And one of the things that really stood out to me was the fact that you were there for the rise of Bolsonaro, who is now coming yeah. under a lot of scrutiny. And there's one interaction in the early stages of the book that really stood out to me between you and, and Bolsonaro. Maybe we could talk about that and just seeing the rise of this fanatical anti-communism in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm here now. I'm in Sao Paulo now. That wasn't exactly the plan. But when the, this global pandemic hit and I couldn't do the book tour, I just stayed in downtown Sao Paulo. So, yeah, I mean, he's very much uh, uh, hanging over my life um, now again. But, yeah, I, I first spoke with him um, the day that Dilma Rousseff was impeached in 2016. And so I got to Brazil in 2010 to cover the rise of an emerging powerhouse on the global stage for the Financial Times. And under Lula and then Dilma, Brazil was probably the most successful social democratic experiment ever undertaken in a large developing country. Um, and that was sort of the day that it all started to fall apart. And I met him in the hallways before he and other Congress persons, but mostly congressmen, um, voted to remove her. And I, and I asked him, Oh, I'm, I'm from the international press. I said, so I'm, I'm, I want to ask you about the way this will look around the world. Don't you think that the world might look upon this uh, uh, impeachment as a less than a legitimate process? Because it was fairly clear to everyone at the time, and I'd written about this, that Dilma Rousseff was accused of almost nothing compared to the things that the people voting to remove her had actually done. And he said, no, 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 the world will rejoice that we're removing Dilma today because it's going to stop us from becoming North Korea. And this was such vintage cold war fire and brimstone that i didn't even use it in the piece it was like oh well that that's off the far right spectrum it's it's off the charts right like well this, Rousseff's this, this, like yeah. a center left leader right right so in you know in her childhood she was a gorilla but I, I mean but as she governed brazil in the center left workers party if she was guilty of anything it was giving away too much money probably to large corporations it was it was absolutely ridiculous <laughs> To, to make this comparison, but that strand of anti-communist fanaticism, this, this, this violence that is ready to be unleashed on any um, real or potential um, um, eruption from below never went away in Brazilian politics. And then two years later, he was elected, and now he's running the country that I'm in right now. So how is it, I'm sorry to interrupt, so how is it that, like, how is it that a far-right candidate can still, in, in a place like Brazil, I, the unenlightened reader, how is it that uh, that kind of rhetoric still carries any kind of sway? Is there, is there a... Can I add something to that real quickly, Casey? Yeah, yeah, go There's for it. There's this uh, character that I think Bolsonaro has actually referenced, uh, and I'm probably botching his name, but... Uh, Alavo de Carvalho, who, uh, as far as I understand, he's just a sort of wacky astrologist that has reinvented himself as like a traditionalist, anti-communist philosopher of, of Brazil for the Brazilian conservatives. And yet he's, you know, not even in Brazil. I think he's in Virginia. Um, and I oh, yeah. wonder often how these people uh, get to where they are. Uh, well, yeah, Olavo de Carvalho, that was like a pretty good pronunciation. He is the guru for the new Brazilian right, and um, he says he's a philosopher. He's really probably a YouTuber. He's a online provocateur, a hard right anti-communist, uh, conspiracy theorist, certainly. And he was always he was always there. I mean, like that's I think that's the the answer. The other question. This never went away, right? So the entire time that Lula and Dilma were running a very mature and respected social democratic center-left administration, you still had reaction just below the surface in Brazil. It never went away. You know, the, the, the democracy is only 
25 years old or so, uh, now 30, I guess. And when that impeachment blew a hole in the center of Brazilian politics, um, Bolsonaro walked in. Now, that wasn't the plan. The center-right forces that united to also impeach Rousseff, they thought that they would benefit. That did not happen. What happened is that you, you, the two of you may remember a, a president named Michel Temer who was running Brazil for a couple of years in the wake of that impeachment. He was wildly unpopular. Like his his approval rating was sometimes pot like two percent uh, plus or minus three percent, if that makes sense. Like it was it was statistically negative at points his approval rating, and with the destruction of the center right as a result of that impeachment, this guy who had been standing on the far far right walked into the center, and because he had been so irrelevant for so long, he was able to claim, partially credibly, that he was not a part of the political system. The reason he wasn't part of it is because no one wanted him to invite him to any of the meetings. He wasn't big enough to be corrupt enough to be um, to be brought down by the corruption investigations that kind of dominated politics in the last five years. But I think that it, that's an important thing to understand about South America. Like, these top-down waves of reactionary violence have been a part of Latin America's history ever since European people came, committed genocide against the natives, and then imported slaves from Africa. And I think, I mean, we'll probably get to this much later, but this was a commonality, I think, between North American and South American anti-communism, which didn't really map so easily onto Asia. Like, when U.S. officials got to Latin America during the Cold War, they found that the white elites here felt very similarly about things. They found that they could really get along with the white elite, white elites in Brazil and the white elites in Brazil were also always afraid of the descendants of enslaved people rising up against them. And they, they, they had this sort of idea of, of liberty, which was based on, you know, property for me that was very, um, that made a lot of sense in, in, in North and South America. And when they went to, Southeast Asia with the same kind of thinking, they were just, it just didn't make sense at all. Um, when they when they tried to bring this kind of thinking to countries that are not settler colonies, to countries where everyone is sort of considered full citizens, in in, in ways that I think that in the Western Hemisphere we don't we do not extend to our, our populations, they they kind of hit a brick wall. And Brazil is I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but Brazil is especially a salient case I think because. Of the sheer number of uh, of uh, chattel slaves imported over the course of the transatlantic slave trade, and and just the sheer length of time, like the the manner in which emancipation occurred and how late it did, uh, exactly kind of highlight the racial dynamics at play and why it maps so well with American foreign policy. Exactly. I mean, it's the same. I mean, people really underestimate the extent to which the countries are similar, right? And when I met um, Ingi, who's one of the characters in the book, the way that she described Brazil as such an outsider, like really helped it gel for me. She said she got to school and she's like, oh, okay, this is a country where they speak a country, they speak a language that's from Europe, even though this isn't Europe. White people are in charge. Just below that, there's another class of people that are allowed to sort of hang out with white people. That's, that's me. Below that are black people. And then below that are indigenous people. And like, that is also the dynamic we have in the United States. We just have different proportions, right? Like the United States is run by white people that descend from colonizers and speak a Western European language. Then there are later groups of immigrants that have almost as much as power, not as much. There are formerly enslaved, the descendants of formerly enslaved peoples, and then the victims of genocide. The only thing that's different is the proportions. You know, before we get into... Uh, what happened in Indonesia, I think we have to go a little bit backwards in time. The aftermath of World War II, it sort of sees, you know, the British Empire is gone. Now you have the two superpowers. You have on one hand the U.S. and you have on the other the Soviet Union. And most people think of the Cold War in those terms, although there's also this third world movement. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And also afterwards about how figures like J. Edgar Hoover looked at communism and their sort of fanatical anti-communism. Right. So, yeah. So although the term is kind of come into disrepute in, in recent decades because of the way that racists use it in 
the United States, I found the distinction between first, second, and third world is pretty useful. So broadly speaking, at the end of World War II, you had three groups of countries. There was the countries that had been imperialist, that had somehow or another controlled uh, other countries directly. This is Western Europe, the United States, and, and Japan. You had the second world, which was the Soviet Union and, and the countries that it had occupied in World War II, so Central and Eastern Europe. And then you had the rest of the world, which is the vast majority of humanity. And these countries, largely speaking, got their independence in the first years after World War II. Sometimes they had to fight for it in the cases of Vietnam or Indonesia. But by the early 50s, they had emerged onto the world stage. And, and the, the concept of the third world was not that they would be less than, is that they would be the new wave of humanity that would take its place in human history. And this was in a very, this was a very optimistic project. And the people that I met that remember what this was like, the way they, their faces change when they talk about this vision. They, they, their eyes light up with this, this idea of what the world would be once the formerly colonized peoples were given the position that they deserved. A hope for a better world, in other words. Yeah, and it was not only a hope, it was like they believed it would happen. It was. It seemed obvious, right? It, you know, well, we're not colonies anymore. We're obviously as smart as them. We have natural resources. Uh, once we are no longer under the yoke of imperial rule, direct imperial rule, I should say, we'll be able to form a new a new world. And, and to a very large extent, this was a movement which thought that capitalism was a white European thing. Capitalism was very much wrapped up in the idea of colonialism. So in in Indonesia, for example, in the in the in the period of the anti-colonial struggle struggle, if you were a socialist, you were an anti-colonialist, and vice versa. They they assumed that there would be some kind of a new economic system they would create, which was less exploitative. And at the same time, you have in the United States the outbreak of what we ended up calling McCarthyism, and in the United States after World War II, the elites there knew how to deal with the Second World. They decided that they were going to confront the Soviet Union. After the quote-unquote loss of China in 1949, they decided to crack down on the left in the United States. But nobody in the CIA, certainly, and, and, and I think in the, the larger political establishment in general in the United States, understood what the Third World was or how to deal with it. Um, there was there were some small <laughs> there were small amounts of people that had had an idea that had been there that had traveled abroad, but this idea this this fanatical anti-communism that I, that uh, J. Edgar Hoover lays out at the time ends up being extended. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll just um, I could just read even what he says if that works he says that um he said that communists were always planning to organize a military revolt which would always culminate in the extermination of police forces and the seizure of all communications and he said one thing is certain the american progress which all good citizens seek such as old age security houses for veterans child assistance and a host of others is being deployed as window dressing by the communists to conceal their true aims and entrap gullible followers the numerical strength of the party's enrolled membership is insignificant for every party member there are 10 others ready willing and able to do the party's work there is no doubt as to where a real communist loyalty rests their allegiance is to russia so he set a, a, a trap right it's 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 a perfectly functional logical death trap where if you're doing anything that is just remotely reformist then you're act, you're only doing that to hide that you're really a communist right you're, you're still a commie even if you just want reforms even if you're not a right. communist no matter if what you're, you do you're yeah exactly if you're being a communist then you're being a communist but if you're not it's because you're hiding being a communist and if there's a lot of you then there's a lot of you which is a problem but if there's not a lot of you then there's definitely a lot of you which is even worse problem, right? And this kind of logic, uh, as we, you know, it's very well understood in the English speaking world that this was applied to domestic liberals in the United States in a way which is like more or less seen as a bad thing these days, but it's, it's far less understood the ways that this exact same kind of logic 
was mapped onto entire parts of the world where the U.S. foreign policy establishment had a much less had much less regard for human life. Now, in this regard, when we talk about the Third World Movement, I guess the thinking of a Hoover or uh, some of these more extreme figures uh, within the U.S. establishment is they're all secretly uh, controlled by the Soviet Union. Uh, there's also another side of this that says, I, I think there's a thing called the Jakarta Axiom that right. recognizes that these this movement, this Third World Movement, isn't necessarily aligned uh, with the Soviet Union at all times? Exactly. So under Truman, it was not clear exactly how you would deal with quote-unquote neutral countries. They knew they didn't like it, but they, they, they thought that perhaps you could deal with it as long as communists were sufficiently repressed. So in 1948, while the Indonesian uh, independence forces are still fighting off the Dutch, there's this power struggle between the left and the right of the independence movement, and the right ends up winning and crushing the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, uh, in, in, during the Revolutionary War, essentially. And that... Uh, in Washington is seen as the axiomatic case of a country that was neutral enough, neutral in the right way that it could be tolerated. Now, two things happened in Indonesia which changed the situation entirely. When Eisenhower takes over, 1953, neutralism is out. Under under uh, Eisenhower and the quote-unquote successes of the early CIA overthrowing governments in Iran in 53 and then Guatemala in 54, neutralism is seen as one, a threat, and two, that's something that can be fixed with this this new uh, shiny tool that has been created, which is the Central Intelligence Agency. So not only is neutralism out anyways, uh, in Indonesia, the Communist Party, which had been seen as sufficiently repressed during the, the, the War of Independence, was participating in elections because there was a multi-party uh, democracy in Indonesia, and they were doing better and better. And of course, we know now from records that Nixon said that democracy is probably the wrong type of government for Indonesia because the communists are the best at it. So by the middle of the 50s, um, not only is neutralism over, not only is the Communist Party doing better and better, Sukarno puts on the Bandung Conference, which is the first ever meeting of he in in the in the opening speech, which you can watch on YouTube, he says this is the first ever meeting of the so-called colored peoples in the history of the world, and it's and it's brought it's bringing together billions of the world's peoples uh, to sort of really cement this third world movement as an actual thing with actual with an actual project with actual um, international exchanges and mechanisms that will move this this project forward, and by then. In the, the Jakarta uh, axiom is out. Uh, the the Indonesian left is a real problem in Washington, and the Eisenhower administration sets that new gang of blue blood Yale boys, the CIA, to work to try to crush Indonesia. You know, it's it's interesting. You mentioned uh, the Iran coup, which I believe was Operation Ajax, and there's also the Guatemala coup, and one thing that stood out to me was, first off, the leader of Guatemala during that time was not really much of a communist, and uh, yet he was seen as unacceptable. Um, Colonel Diaz takes over for him, and there's a point in the book where you you go over a conversation that Diaz had with uh, one of the CIA station chiefs. And the right. station chief says, you made a big mistake when you took over the government. Colonel, you're just not convenient for the requirements of American foreign policy. And he yep. basically says, you're going to have to kill all these Guatemalans. They need to be shot immediately. And Diaz right. says, but why? Because they're communists, is the response. Right, right. And uh, that was Enno Hobbing, by the way, uh, former a former journalist for Time magazine who had switched to the agency, which was – something that happened fairly often in the early days of the CIA. And you're absolutely right. So Jacobo Arbenz was at best a liberal reformer, right? And what he said in his inauguration speech, and he wasn't lying, 
is that he tried he wanted to bring Guatemala from feudalism to capitalism that he wanted to do put in place the basic reforms that would make sort of the, the that would allow the free market to work of course the Guatemalan Communist Party was very important and influential influential again because they're very well organized and they had been active in the country for a long time but he 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 could easily have been a Republican in the United States. Like, but what, what was the problem with, with Arbenz? Number one, his land reform policy was going to directly take on United Fruit, which was extremely well connected in Washington. Number two, just the idea of having a reformist government in Central America was seen as very dangerous to the State Department. And we know now from declassified files, the danger was not that there would be a Soviet encampment in our backyard. The danger was not that they would ruin the economy. The danger was not that they would eventually somehow threaten the United States. The danger was that they would set an example to other countries in the region if they were seen as successful. And so all these things come together. A lot of times there's there's debates as to, well, what really powers U.S. interventions? Is it is it bare economic profit motives? Is it, you know, is it, you know, blood for oil? Or is it the exaggerations and paranoia of geopolitical goals like anti-communism or anti-terrorism or whatever? And I think that these things, that doesn't have to be a, you don't have to have, that doesn't have to be a binary, right? I think if you have one, exactly. If you have both, it's probably going to happen, right? Uh, If you have one, it might, but if you, if you get these things working together as they did in Guatemala, then it's probably going to happen. And like the way that the Arbenz coup happened, you know, we kind of reset history after World War II, and I do even in the book. But like, if you're a leader of Central America, you know that if like the Marines might be coming, you got to go. And so Arbenz, even though Che Guevara, who was in Guatemala at the time, and other people on the left told Arbenz not to give in, that he had to, to had to fight because the, the consequences would be too grave if he gave in to this sort of fairly obviously slapdash coup. Right. Like it wasn't Arbenz didn't think that the invasion was going to succeed, but Arbenz knew the U.S. was behind it. So eventually you're going to, you know, it's eventually you can't stick around. But when uh, when he uh, agreed, he he agreed to leave, agreeing to pass over um, power to that colonel that you decided. But then the U.S. came in and said, no, 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 no. Actually, uh, the country is going to custody arm us, our man who we've been arming. Uh, and there's nothing you can do about it. And there wasn't, they, you know, he, he was right. Like they did have to do what the U.S. said, and they and they did. And in Guatemala, you know, if you go there to this day, the, the long tail of that intervention is is very obvious. Well, it's, it's yeah, very. You, you, no, I'm sorry. You you mentioned very late in the book that uh, during interviews you'll ask people when did democracy die in Guatemala, and their response is nearly universal, 1954. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's really, it's not, it's not controversial. And people remember what happened. I mean, one, one guy that I met, Miguel, I don't want to try to reproduce his last name, but he remembers the bombing of, you know, he was on the way to school having breakfast and the bombs were dropping on Guatemala City and he was terrified. And, you know, the, the memory was seared into his brain forever. And like, this is ancient history for us in the United States, but like, what if, you know, what if, what if, where, I mean, you know, I'm from Los Angeles, like, what if Moscow had bombed LA in 1954? You know, would they, would, would we, would I, would my family have forgotten that? You know, like it's, it's not a long time ago if, if, for, if it's that traumatic of a, uh, uh, of a, of a historical break. Now, what I was going to say is that the reason we talked uh, a little briefly here about, uh, the Guatemalan coup and Operation Ajax, the 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 coup in Iran, is because these are almost precursors uh, to what comes later. Before we get into that, I think the the last thing we need to cover before we dive knee deep into uh, Indonesia is there's two figures uh, that are pretty central to this book uh, that work with the agency, and one is a guy named Smiling Jones, and the other is Frank Wisner and his gang of weirdos. And they are two very, very different people from very different b- backgrounds, it seems like. 
Right. And um, Frank Wisner is the father of CIA covert operations. So like everybody else that was in the early CIA, he's a blue blood. He wasn't – his blood wasn't quite as blue as most of the guys in there because most of them were in like Yale secret societies. But um, as you might have noticed in the book, like he grew up in the part of the South that, you know, he – as a child, he did not dress himself. His black maid put his clothes on for him. And he was a real true dyed-in-the-wool cold warrior. He believed – that you had to fight communism everywhere, no matter what. And, and he th- put that, uh, I mean, even in the CIA, people were like, this guy really is really intensely committed to fighting quote unquote communism. I, I think William Colby, even at one point, uh, who helped head up the Phoenix program said that, uh, you know, Wisner is, is going a little bit unhinged. Oh, well, he did go, he, he, he went unhinged later. I mean, he ended up very much losing losing his mind um but even you know even when he was sort of more lucid earlier uh uh his cia colleagues were like, yeah this guy's really really intense about communism so and then then you have howard jones who i think uh is kind of your your like do-gooder american he like really wants to help the world and he he's, he joins the state department he is very proud of his work as a journalist early in his life where he, he takes on the KKK and even though, you know, causes him a professional black guy, he, he's, he's glad that he does it. And when he joins the state department after world war two, he's the kind of guy that does not see the world in black and white. He, he gets to a certain Asian country and he goes and he talks to everyone, including the, the, the so-called enemies of the United States. And he, he wants to know what Indonesia is really like, or he wants to know what Taiwan's really like. And he, and he, and he's trying to always tell the guys back in Washington, like, no, 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 like, this country's different than that other country. And if you try to map your own prejudices onto this country, it's not going to work. And he, and even the quote unquote enemies of America in, in Indonesia, for example, saw in him kind of like a good natured goofball that wanted to do good. And these guys end up, developing very different approaches to what was the most important Asian, well, the most important Cold War conf- confrontation um, after China in the 50s, which was Indonesia. And it's interesting how they have, uh, in some ways, an accidentally complementary approach to uh, regime change, e- even if J- Jones, in this case, is uh, very unintentionally involved. Yeah, I mean, that's the way that it tragically plays out, is that the on-the-ground insights, the sort of robust analysis of the situation that he gains from being sort of trusted in a very tragic way is put to use in in a manner that I imagine he would have never... He, would, he was horrified to find, find out about, right? So in... So let's, yeah, maybe in 1958, these two men end up going to war on accident because in 1958, um, the CIA bombs Indonesia. And this is their second attempt to try to stop the rise of the left in Indonesia. The first is that they pay off a lot of politicians in a right-wing conservative Muslim party hoping that they'll win elections, and they don't. The PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party, is just doing better and better. In 1958, there is a... Aerial, uh, aerial operation launched over Indonesia where CIA pilots bomb the country in the attempt to assist, um, some regional rebellions turn into a full scale civil war that'll break the country into pieces. Now, Jones doesn't know this. He's just been made ambassador. The reason he is made ambassador is so that the ambassador would not know what is happening. So he's having meetings with Sukarno and the foreign minister Subandrio. And Sukarno at this point is the the leader of Indonesia. Yes, exactly. So Sukarno is the the man who brings together all the independence forces at the end of World War II and ends up being sort of the founding father of the nation, organizing the Bandung Conference. He's very often not a good administrator. He's often not a great president at a technocratic level but he's the he's he's the prophet of indonesian identity he's 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 beloved as the the man that sort of created indonesia as an idea and jones doesn't know the cia is bombing the country but the indonesians have a good idea 
And when one of the pilots crash lands on the island of um, Bone and is caught, everybody that had assumed the worst of it, about America, and this is the Indonesian left and uh, um, parts of the, the center as well, are all proven right. So the CIA, in trying to recreate the successes of 1953 and 1954, they fail very badly in, in Indonesia, and they're caught, and they're humiliated, and Howard Jones has to sort of deal with this, right? He has to apologize and say, I didn't know, and convince the people back in Washington to change tactics, and they do change tactics. He convinces them, after having several conversations with the Indonesian military, with the Indonesian people, that actually the thing to do is not to go to war with the Indonesian armed forces. The thing to do is to become best friends with them, and try to to establish control or sort of ideological hegemony within the armed forces. Let's let's be their friends. Let's train them. Let's back them. They're anti-communist, or at least they can. We can. They're the they're the closest thing to anti-communist in Indonesia. Let's get them on our side. And that's exactly what happened. And they and they start to bring thousands of members of the Indonesian armed forces to train in Kansas. Um, and that's the sort of that his his approach, the, the the smiling Jones approach, remains dominant from 1958 to 1964. And because people are listening to him when he says, "No, no, no, it's fine. Just back the army, be friends with Sukarno. There's no reason for a conflict here. It's it's fine. This country, this country is nationalist in the sense of wanting their independence, but they're not a threat to the U.S. Just it's fine. And and he sees the anti-colonial struggle as not having to be necessarily uh, communist in nature, in other words. Exactly. He's he's very proud of the fact that he's able to hammer home to the people back in Washington that there's a difference between communism and uh, third world neutrality, third world anti-colonial independence. And um, the one man in American politics who is saying the same kind of things <laughs> – in the late 1950s is John F. Kennedy. Um, and so when John F. Kennedy is elected in 1960, Sukarno is overjoyed because Sukarno recognizes that Kennedy is the one guy in America that says that the third world has a right to its own destiny. Um, because in the late 50s, JFK had spoken out against France's involvement in Algeria. JFK had traveled the world and got to know a lot of the leaders of the third world movement, a lot of them in sort of a, in a very, you know, in sort of like, ridiculous and hilarious ways they had sort of given him like lectures about how stupid the american uh attitude towards the third world was but he you know he had gotten these talking to's from nehru in india and others like him and he understood what was going on now when kennedy actually takes over everything changes very quickly because the bay of pigs blows up in his face and very quickly kennedy i believe i mean you know, this is speculation not, but the way I sort of present it is that he realizes what happens if you're the president of the United States and what you have to deal with, not only from your covert operations uh, people, because, you know, the the execution of Lumumba, which was not exactly done by the CIA, but it was, happened while he was taking office. Right after he takes office, the Bay of Pigs explodes, and he flips very quickly. He flips to from being somebody that is advocating for third world um, self-determination to just one of the most enthusiastic cold warriors and, and um, users of the covert operations apparatus uh, in the 20th century. Now, to give an idea, when we talk about Wisner and this gang of weirdos and the covert operations side of this, just, just how, you know, dark, does that rabbit hole get this this covert operations it seems like uh it can get pretty intense uh stay behind networks i believe are also involved in all of this stuff yeah so the, the one of the very early things that they did in europe and this is before they realized that like they weren't very good at europe um they organized um you know whoever they could get from eastern europe that would into these groups that would be in theory supposed to um, stopping in a potential invasion of Western Europe, but they ended up being sort of far right paramilitary groups that did all kinds of very horrible things. Um, Operation Gladio is the, the most common name for what ends up coming out of that throughout the uh, second half of the 20th century. 
And of course, there is all of the uh, mind control experiments. So MK Ultra, um, the the attempt to use LSD to see if minds could be controlled involved the kidnapping of unsuspecting Americans um, for experiments. Um, the man who oversaw MK Ultra was the same man that came up with the poison that was supposed to murder Patrice Lumumba, the first leader of the Congo. Um, that operation ended up fizzling and they found a different way to have him killed. But I mean, if you, there's, you couldn't imagine a worse set of operations, right? I mean, it was really the, 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 the activities of the, the covert operations of the CIA in the 1950s are the kinds of things that you would be called insane for making up, right? right. There, there's it, one point I think you bring up in the, in the story where, uh, Wisner tries to convince leftists in the Philippines that an Aswang or a vampire is yeah. killing uh, oh, people. Oh, you're going to go with that and not the porno? I mean, yeah, oh, there's yeah. a Carno porno tape. I mean, we can't get into all of it, but it, some of these ideas are like, uh, you know, Keystone Cops of the CIA almost. Like well, this poison is... Poison cigars and stuff, it's amazing. Yeah, so it's like, it's a weird... It's funny and it's not, because... So, the, so, um, the Hux... We're a Filipino uh, force that refused to stand down after the end of World War II. They were sort of a left-leaning militia that you could compare maybe to, like, Greece is a, is a, is a good example. Well, yeah, Greece is a very good example because in both countries, the U.S. Um, organized counterinsurgency operations to make sure that the, the country went back into the hands of the people they wanted it to go to, not into the hands of the people that actually fight, fought the fascists. So – as part of their psychological, I mean, they were they were so you know they were so excited about this stuff. But as part of their psychological warfare tactics that they invented and thought were so spectacularly effective, they took a huck, drained the blood out of his body, put um, like a hole in his neck so it would look like he had had his blood sucked by a vampire, and then spread the rumor in the villages. That oh no no this is proof that um, the spirits are are against them and I mean I don't know enough about the Filipino context to know if like people believe this or if people just were terrified by the insanity of the United States because I know that in in Vietnam and this is something I did some work on um, an art project in Vietnam they they did psychological warfare where they played a horrible tape uh, of ghosts talking from beyond the grave to Vietnamese soldiers and the message was you know give up or else you're going to haunt the world forever like we are it's a horrible tape you can listen to and the way that I understand it is not exactly that Vietnamese people thought this was a real these were really ghosts talking to them but it was just like a horrible awful evil thing that the enemy was doing to mess with them and it was and it worked to demoralize them for that reason but yeah I mean it's like it's this combination of insanely half cocked and stupid plans but then when they work or even when they don't it's like what you're trying to destroy the the psyche of a nation right like the because like the the porno story which we might as well do like uh when they couldn't get rid of sakar in the late 50s they 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 came up with a plan to assassinate him but they didn't go forward with it um, they also had a tape made in Los Angeles that Bing Crosby and his brother Larry produced. There was supposed to be a sex tape that was supposed to expose that Sukarno was not only sexually deviant, but that he had slept with a KGB agent and was therefore uh, compromat- compromised, compromised uh, uh, by Russia. And they didn't release it. And it's like, it's ridiculous. It's insane. They, you know, there's like wigs and there's, a Mexican actor, they're trying to get look Asian, but like if you think about it, it's like that's not fu- like they're trying to destroy the founding father of a country because they don't understand. They think he might be an enemy of the United States somehow, so they're like, oh, let's just you know, let's make it, let's like humiliate and traumatize an entire nation psychologically because that might get them on our side in the Cold War. Well, it's interesting too because I, I believe some of these leaders, I don't know if. Uh, it was Sukarno in particular, um, maybe at the the Bandung conference. Uh, but th- there were leaders in, in this third world movement that would actually make appeals to U.S. ideas about freedom. Um, and yet this is all ignored by the Wisners of the world who 
you know, they think they're the good guys, right? I, I, I like how you point out that uh, Frank Wisner views himself as a patriot. He's doing the right thing, but he's such a fanatical ideologue that he's willing to destroy entire nations. Yeah. And, uh, no, I'm glad you brought that up. It's it, – the, the, the hope – the way that we portray the Cold War is a battle between equals – and it's portrayed that the communists are the pr- provocateurs. Uh, both of those things are wrong. The United States was far more powerful than the Soviet Union at every point during the Cold War. Uh, often the conflict was actually with the Third World, who was far weaker than even the Soviet Union and its allies. And everybody else in the world, from the Soviet Union to the people to the Third World Communist parties to the Third World Social Democratic parties, were all very afraid of provoking the United States. Everybody tried to get along with the United States. So Ho Chi Minh, in his Declaration of Independence, it's he reproduces the U.S. Declaration of Independence in 1945. He wants the United States to think of him as following in the revolutionary tradition of the North Americans because he doesn't want to go to war with the most powerful country that's ever existed. In Bandung in 1955, in a very almost pathetic way, they look on the calendar – for the date that they have set the conference for and they find something from the U S revolutionary tradition that they would, that they can say, Oh no, 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 actually it's, it's like you. And what they found on that date was Paul Revere's ride. Um, even Mao after the, the, the victory of the Chinese communists in 1949, which by the way, Stalin didn't want to happen because he, (laughs) again, he was not his stance in, in the immediate cold war, the immediate post-war years, even though he's, of course, you know, willing to commit horrible atrocities whenever they serve him, he did not want to provoke the United States in this in this period. But when Mao took over, he was hoping that there would be a good relationship with the United States. This is absolutely not the case of, you know, and if you think about it for two seconds, it makes uh, it makes sense, you know, like no matter how hard-headed or revolutionary someone might be in, in Indonesia or Vietnam or Cuba or whatever, why are you going to pick a fight with the United States? And uh, across the board, they never really wanted to. I mean, you have rare exceptions, which are probably pretty well known, but Sukarno, Ho Chi Minh, uh, I mean, especially Sukarno. I mean, at least Ho Chi Minh knew it was probably not going to work. Sukarno um, believed and hoped that he would maintain good relations with the United States. Um, And and he he did uh, under Howard Jones until John F. Kennedy is, is killed. Now, that, that's going to bring us to the shift away from what could be called the Jones method uh, right. with LBJ. But w- one thing I want to note about Howard Jones is it's interesting the gambit he makes of, you know, we can work with Indonesia and it doesn't need to be this, you know, nightmare thing. And, you know, let's let's just side with the army. Uh, and it sort of creates I think it creates the groundwork for what could be called, uh, as you put it in the book, the the state within the state. Uh, right. If I may also build on that too, uh, how do the civic action program? How does that factor into this collusion between uh, CIA interests and the uh, Indonesian army? Well, I, I, I want if Vincent could, maybe you could explain that idea of of the state within the state and and how Jones sort of contributes to this. Yeah, so it's not new. Uh, it's not the first. You know, it, it's not the. This is not. Uh, an import to Indonesia in 1958. Uh, the Indonesian army had always sort of played some kind of a role in uh, in the post-war or the post-revolutionary era. But in Washington, uh, officials had been looking around the world and seeing that to modernize, quote unquote, um, countries had to make this big jump from sort of backwards to modern. And we're in modern in this schema schematization is just being like america and so modernization theory often posited that you needed to get some kind of group to do this and in the third world the military was good and you know we, they could be a reliable way to do this so 1958 the shift that howard jones um makes possible is based on not going you know just kind of barging in and going to war with the army and hoping you can break the country into pieces but finding elements that already exist within it and nurturing them. So when you train all of these um, Indonesian military officers in Kansas, they get trained in this this way of thinking that the army can play a big role in the country, that they can um, 
have an economic role, that they can basically be uh, if a shadow government, if not a government. And the, the civic action program, and it, it ends up being kind of a shadow, uh, shadow government. So the, the, they had already gotten huge amounts of power as a result of the CIA invasion. This was sort of the very ironic thing is that the CIA invasion got granted the, the, the army much more powers because there was an emergency, state of emergency declared. They ended up taking a lot of local control around the country. They had – their prestige had been – uh, uh, and this is in 58? Uh, this is in 58. The, the, in, in 58, this, ar- this already happens when wis- the Wisner method is being employed, is that they get more power as a result of this this civil war. And then uh, Jones turns around and says, no, let's grab, let's grab this thing and nurture it. And so from 1958 to 1954, especially with the arrival of the Kennedy administration, because the Kennedy brothers are very into counterinsurgency doctrine, they're very into military-led modernization theory. This is something that is put into place all throughout Latin America at the same time. The military is trained to be a shadow government, dual power, you might want to put it, um, and uh, potentially the government. Now, there are splits in the Indonesian military that Howard Jones' memoirs um, – uh, uh, reveal that there are people in the Indonesian military that say, no, 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 we should never do this. So Nasution, one of the main partners of the United States in this era, he says, I'll never do, we'll never do like a Latin America dictatorship. That's not what we do. Uh, other elements in the Indonesian military are more amenable to this state within a state project. Um, but what you have, and, and, and I think it's important for me to stress that like the reason I'm being slightly vague about what the civic act- action programs are is because they're still declassified. We still do not know exactly what was actually happening um, under the tutelage of the U.S. military from 1958 to 1965. Um, I asked. <laughs> I, called, I called the CIA and I asked them to tell me, but unsurprisingly that did not work. But it is the it is the kind of – it is creating dual power almost. And Sukarno, who was very brilliant as a sort of philosopher of Indonesian identity, as I said, perhaps did not understand the instability that was inherent in the political system that he was overseeing from 1959 to 1965. And this is a period in which the, the election stopped. So the election stopped after the CIA invasion. Um, and it's, the, basically, the, it's basically Sukarno and... Uh, the communists versus the West and the army is sort of the the narrative, right? It it it. There are many parties that are allowed to participate in quote unquote guided democracy in 1959, but as the years go on, it's like no, these are the two poles, and, Su- and Sukarno stands above them. Is on the right you have the U.S. backed army, on the left you have the unarmed Indonesian Communist Party, which, even though they would win elections if there were any, and everybody knows that knows this. They are aware that their position in society relies on Sukarno's blessing. So they, they support Sukarno very fully. Instead of trying to win political power directly, they try to get as many people in Indonesia involved in the party as they can. So they get 25 to 30 percent of the population either directly in the party or in one of the party's affiliated organizations. And the way that they exercise power is basically through rallies – and mass participation. They have no theory, theoretical or practical um, acceptance of armed struggle. They 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 think that the, what they need to do is to support Sukarno, uh, put pressure on him, maybe with big protests here and there, prove how many people agree with them, and take the country uh, as a result of that on a more left-leaning path towards capitalist development, but not towards revolution. They were not agitating for some kind of a um, full, full, uh, full communism now. It was, it was very much a, a long-term project, and they were not unhappy with the way it had been going. And on the other side, you had the right-wing military, which had not – I mean, even – I say right-wing, but if you were to look at the way that they spoke up until 1965, they also – would use the language of anti-imperialism, of of anti-colonial independence. Of so they would use sort of the the, the global uh, language of leftist struggle, but they were anti-communist and they were opposed to the PKI having any power. They repeatedly blocked the PKI from having power, and it was not a coincidence that they were uh, receiving direct um, 
assistance from the U.S. while they were acting in this anti-communist way. So it's around this time that you had the Sino-Soviet split. How does that factor into the decisions of the PKI? Uh, yeah, so the Sino-Soviet split is interesting because they kind of take both sides in a way. So the by the early 1960s, the PKI is the largest communist party outside of the Soviet Union and China. So when the, P, the Sino-Soviet split actually happens, the PKI does not go with Mao. The PKI... Uh, officially technically accepts Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin in 1956. Um, so Mao considers them a quote unquote revisionist party. Um, they remain Orthodox Marxist Leninists in the, in the old, the very, very old school sense. However, as the sixties develop, Sukarno is, um, insisting upon his right to, uh, territorial control over regions that should have been part of Indonesia, he believes, or parts of Malaysia that should not have been decolonized in the way that he believes. So the Soviet Union, as the 60s go on, are very uninterested in Sukarno's um, fights with Britain over Malaysia, most specifically. But China is willing to lend a little bit of support um, you know, not direct support really, but at least, you know, they, they are much more amenable to these moves that Sukarno takes. So the PKI re- remains, on the one hand, technically revisionist, um, in Mao's terminology, but two, not really on good terms with Brezhnev, because Brezhnev is not interested in, in making waves in Southeast Asia. And three, they have their entire whole thing going, which is to be a mass-based populist party that is going to change society through um, just the strength of numbers rather than being a, a, a vanguard party. They would they had these kind of strange ideological contortions where they would say they were Leninist, but like in if they were, it was a very very different type of communist party, and they didn't feel the need to be like. Those other countries, they were huge. They were doing very well. They had convinced a third of their country to, to, to back them at least, and probably most of the rest of the country that they were fine. You know, they were not, um, they didn't see the need for arms or for, uh, or to take orders from anyone, really. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, uh, before I'll let my co host continue on this line of discussion, uh, I ate it. A I D I T. Yeah, I did. Thank you. He uh, he he was uh, Mao and him talked uh, before 1965 about the uh, the lack of uh, left militia in Indonesia. And I felt that kind of tragically paralleled how Fidel Castro approached Allende in the yeah, 1970s. It's, it's very similar, and, and in both cases, these were leaders that had seen kind of what happens. <laughs> uh, it's very dark to think about it that way, but you know. Like I said, Che Guevara was in Guatemala in 1954 when the coup went much worse than Arbenz thought it would, and people got killed, and there was a horrible, uh, horrible dictatorship for a very long time afterwards. And Fidel kind of quote unquote learned those lessons that you have to be a little bit more uh, authoritarian or at least defensive. Well, in, in a way, Sukarno sort of for sort of realized that in so much as that move towards you know, quote unquote, guided democracy uh, after the 58 coup attempt. Uh, I guess where I want to go from here is you have uh, Sukarno moving towards this idea of guided democracy, which is a little bit less free, I guess. After the 58 coup, I would say that's, you know, reasonable. You know, you would go into a little bit of crisis mode after a coup attempt. Then we get to September 30th, 1965 and this is the beginning of the real horrific aspect of the book what happens on september 30th 1965 so what happens before is that howard jones is removed and howard jones is removed as he sees his strategy fall apart lbj doesn't want to do this anymore and they bring in a guy that everybody knows is a coup master like the, 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 this is this is the kind of thing that happened in the Cold War all the time. You bring in somebody that is has a reputation for being a regime a regime change ambassador, and they brought in 
Marshall Green from Korea, uh, who, who was exactly seen exactly that way. And what we do know about CIA and MI6 activities in the period from Green's arrival to September 30th, 1965, is that both British and U.S. intelligence services wanted to make a clash happen between the left and the right. They were using black uh, propaganda, disinformation, and every tool at their disposal to try to make a clash happen. Again, we don't know what exactly they were doing. This is declassified. I'm sorry, this is not yet declassified, but we know that's what they wanted to happen. On September 30th, in a very mysterious way, this is exactly what happens. On the early morning of October 1st, a group calling itself the September 30th movement um, sends out, and this is a military, a group with military leadership, they send out groups of soldiers to kidnap seven um, generals that they say they believe are planning a right-wing coup. Six of these generals end up dead. To this day, no one understands why, if this was an accident, if this was infiltration, if this was planned from the beginning. And immediately, Suharto, who is friends with the leaders of the September 30th movement, but was not targeted by them, even though he was well-known as a right-wing figure, he immediately takes control of the country, immediately shuts down all all media that would uh, contradict the propaganda story that he's about to spread. And he, and he tells the whole country that it was actually the communists that were responsible for this. The communists had taken these six heroic generals uh, prisoner. The communist women's organization had performed some kind of an erotic, deviant, satanic Marxist dance and tortured them to death. These feminists were witches, in other words, according to... Exactly, yeah. exactly. exactly. The, it was quite literally the invocation of castration anxiety and, and the legend of witches to claim that they had cut off the genitals of these heroic generals in some kind of a deranged communist murder orgy. Now... Obviously, none of this has happened, it, but it took us a very long time to even find out that this didn't happen. The, 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 the extent to which that Suharto established um, control over the country's media and over the country very quickly is to this day something we don't quite understand. Um, he's not the guy that was supposed to take over. The guy that was supposed to take over is the, is the man Nasutio, and who I told you earlier said he would never lead a, a dictatorship. Uh, no one can figure out how he came up with this amazingly perfect psychological, uh, uh, you know, this, this perfectly crafted horror story so quickly. But we do know that right away, as soon as the State Department realizes what's happening, is that they help him do this. And then this propaganda story about the unique evil of the Communist Party turns into, we need to crush the Communist Party, and if you don't help us, you'll be crushed too. And throughout the country in different ways, there are mass arrests or people turning themselves in on the left. Uh, and the prisons are filled up with every manner of quote-unquote communists. Some are actual Communist Party members. Some are just members of these other organizations that I referred to earlier, peasants' organizations, teachers' organizations, cultural organizations. And the prisons are filled up with people that think they're just kind of being detained for a bit. But what happens is, in the middle of the night, some of these prisoners are taken out and murdered and thrown into rivers or their bodies are discarded. Often the executions are carried out not exactly by the military by themselves, but by paramilitary groups that had been formed perhaps during the state, during a state, within a state uh, period that had been, or that were attached to other political parties or that were attached to Religious groups, depending on which part of the country you were in, this varied. But as a rule, what happened was you were taken from prison in the middle of the night or sometimes in the day, and somebody stabbed you, strangled you, threw you in a river. That probably wasn't an actual officer, but the officer was overseeing the whole thing. And nobody knew what happened to you. Your your family members, I mean, the people that were in jail had a pretty good idea that you didn't you left and you never came back. But there was no acknowledgement, certainly not in mainstream Indonesia media, that these killings were taking place. I mean, if you lived close enough to a river, you, you knew this. But in Jakarta, where there were less killings, uh, it was not 
it wasn't like the government was saying, oh, yeah, we're, we're executing these people. It was, it was disappearances, as John Rusa, the historian, led me to he, – he pressed me to investigate that angle, and I think he is right, is that these should be considered mass disappearances, not just, just mass murder. And at every step of the way, the United States praised, encouraged, and assisted this operation – they didn't have to do a lot, though, and this is very important. This is very different from what happened in the 50s in, in Iran and Guatemala and even the invasion of 58. They didn't, you know, at one point, the, the CIA office in Bangkok approves the distribution of arms to the military, but they don't need it. They already are the only armed force in the country. They've had seven years of U.S. training and backing. And so they decide, oh, well, if they need anything, they'll let us know. They're doing a great job on their own. But at one point, we know uh, a member of the State Department's um, staff hands over lists of people that the military can make sure that they've killed. We know that as the military is killing lots of people and the United States is getting reports of these mass murders, the United States continues to press the military to remove Sukarno and get rid of the left and they know very well what that means right i mean there's no as far as i know there's no declassified file that says kill more people but while the mass killings are happening they say you know your support is dependent on crushing the left and getting rid of sukarno and this goes on not for that long within just a matter of months Indonesia goes from the leader of the anti-imperialist left-leaning third world movement to a quiet, compliant partner of the Cold War uh, order that the United States has constructed. And this is this is all done, I believe, under the banner of I believe I believe this was called Operation Annihilation. Yeah. So that is, I mean, so like Operasi Penumpasan, like. That was only uncovered by Australian historian Jess Melvin in the last couple of years. So, like, it's, it's really striking to me. And so, like, you know, I come, I kind of come in as a journalist kind of being like, ah, oh, let's figure this out. And there's this, this, people have been doing careful scholarly work for 40, 50, 60 years, and they, they take it for granted that they're not allowed to know what actually happened. And I come in and I'm like, well, why don't we just know? Like, what, why has there not been sufficient pressure on the United States government and the Indonesian government just to show us what actually happened because she came across these files um, on the island of Sumatra just a few years ago that established more forcefully than had been possible before the extent to which the military really spearheaded the mass killings for a long time. The, 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 the official narrative was like, ah, it just kind of happened. Um, what what and, was the term they used? Uh, wasn't there a brigadier general that used the term "down to the roots"? That, that's exactly. a very haunting statement. Down to the roots. So that's that's uh, Ishak Juarsa, uh, who uh, uh, studied in Kansas. So he he like the other man that used this exact same phrase, Moko Ginta, were both Kansas trained, U.S. Um, educated. Uh, um, Army officers. And again, like, we don't know if the mass murder was planned in advance, was planned in advance with the help of the United States, if it happened spontaneously because they arrested a lot of people and just decided to murder them, if that happened spont spontaneously with U.S. advising advisement or if it happened without and then the U.S. just got excited about what was happening. None of that we know. And I and I, I don't think it's like – I'm not – satisfied with like with the task of piecing that together based on scraps like just why why is it that this massacre is so deeply memory hold and so pushed pushed so far to the back of 20th century history that we can't just force the parties to to, to show us what actually happened and, and i want to note right here that uh, you know there's embassy cables uh coming f uh to the state department uh when uh, that leader we mentioned earlier, Ait, um, Ideas. is, is Ideas. Yeah, he, he's captured, uh, gives a false confession, and they know it's a false confession. Uh, 
yep. at, at the embassy. Uh, not only that, but I I, I really want to hope well, he doesn't he doesn't give a false confession. They murder him and then they just say that he said whatever they want. Yeah. Right, right. But but what I really want to hone in on is I I don't think my listeners they may not understand the extent of just how bad this mass murder that really starts in October of 65 is. I mean, the, the PKI uh, was so popular that you couldn't just find all the members, right? I mean, th- this was just indiscriminate mass slaughter, uh, you know, just killing as many people as possible. Uh, and it's a it's a system of terror uh, to get people to say, oh, I'm, I'm just going to back off from all this activism. Yeah, I mean, I think so. The really dark thing about sort of the Jakarta method, as it's called in the, the, the book title, is that as a rule, they didn't kill more people than they needed to. This was effective violence. It was done for a purpose. Like, because killing a lot of people is very hard. And, you know, you don't, people don't like doing it. Like, so that there's stories that to get to, to get the actual murders to do it, they had to like drug them or get them drunk or threaten them, you know. And in the case, the horrible case of Indonesia is that so many of people in the country were on the left, either in the party or somehow affiliated with the party, that killing one million people was not even close to everyone that they would have had to kill if they were going to kill every leftist, right? But one million people was enough to get that 25 to 30 percent of the country to not ever talk about it ever again. Right. So the point of it was not to kill every single leftist in the country, because to do that, you'd have to get rid of a third of the country. That would be not only obvious to the rest of the world, it would it, it would it would destroy your country. Right. But with the one million or five hundred thousand or three million, the, the numbers vary with the amount that they disappeared in this short period of time, very brutally and very, very com- in a very complete way, establishing that they were in charge. To this day, everybody else will not talk about their political activity. So except for the very rare cases of the survivors that I were able to meet and get to know well enough that they wanted to talk, as a rule, anybody that lived in Indonesia in 1962 will not tell you what their political – they'll tell you, oh, I, don't, I didn't know anything. But Because the possibility of being labeled as a, as a communist to this day is so powerful in Indonesia that everybody just – let Suharto win. You know, Suharto, he proved his point. He's in charge now. And and at the same time in the U.S., I mean, I think there's an inkling in the U.S. at at this time that this is, you know, very brutal, you know, slaughter, mass slaughter of people. I The, the term that haunted me was that one writer who referred to it as uh, the savage transformation. He was saying it in, in like this positive sense it's absolutely horrifying yeah james reston who is a like famous liberal columnist at the new york times yeah it's at this point that i think we finally get the title screen like the jakarta method the lesson has been learned and now it's in applying it yeah but before we close out i guess we've covered the actual uh violence that occurred in indonesia how though does this extend into the rest of the world how does the specter of jakarta extend into places like uh, santiago chile yeah so there's two ways right so although we've totally forgotten about it um this was a hugely important event in 1965 everybody on the left and the right was looking to indonesia this is the largest communist party outside of soviet union china and two Two waves sort of uh, are formed by this this horrible explosion of violence, and they and they go off in different directions. On the left, a lot of people come to the conclusion: oh, we need to arm, or else we'll get killed. And the Cultural Revolution in China might be some way a a um, related to this phenomenon. Certainly, the Philippine Communist Party, certainly Pol Pot, certainly Latin American leftists all came to the conclusion: oh no, we need to get hardcore, or else we're going to die. Now, on the other side of the political spectrum, Washington's real uh, potential or already allies on the anti-communist right, they saw how big of a success this was. And they saw that you could get away with it. It was it was not only something that worked to take power. As long as you just told Washington that you believed in liberty or whatever afterwards – 
you never got punished. It was you were you were accepted into the the group of nations which was favored by the the hegemon. And so in Brazil and Chile in the early 70s, you get the appearance of this word Jakarta, which is meant to to signify mass violence as something that we might do. Uh, and in both cases, they do do it. So in, under Allende, it's a threat that is plastered on the houses of, of supporters of the government or people that work in the government. In Brazil, it's a, uh, a secret operation who was never, which was never really confirmed. We only know from secondhand reports that that was maybe called that. But it means we're going to kill you. And when the CIA eventually succeeds in um, removing Allende in 1973, the Jakarta does come. They kill, they do kill the people that they have threatened, and this is, includes the husband of one of the the people I got to know for this book, Carmen Hertz. Um, and again, if, you know, they were also right. You know, they if if by looking to Indonesia they came to the conclusion that they could get away with this kind of stuff. They were absolutely right. If by looking at Indonesia they, they concluded that this that, that the Jakarta method was effective, they were absolutely right. Um, these regimes, you know, shaped life in South America to a large extent to this day. And of course, uh, of course, the United States did not turn around and 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 say that Chile, you can't do this. They assisted in the creation of Operation Condor, which was a international murder mechanism in South America and the, and the member countries of Operation Condor killed tens of thousands of people and then the member countries of Operation Condor helped train right-wing death squads in, in Central America which killed hundreds of thousands of people and until the end of the Cold War this was a fundamental part of the way that the right and that the right of course being the side that the US, the US is on fought the Cold War. That's so chilling that you know, plastered across walls in, in Santiago, there were just the words, Jakarta is coming. Uh, it's such a, a, a scary threat when you realize what happened in Indonesia. And, and later on, when you talk about uh, the Contras in El Salvador, you have that one major uh, whose name I will not pronounce because I will just uh, completely butcher it. But he says, you can be a communist without being without actually being a communist. Oh, you know, you can you can you can be a communist even though you think you are not a communist. Right, right. It, it, it harkens back to that sort of death trap logic of of Hoover. Yeah, and he killed he killed Oscar Romero, the the El Salvadorian priest that was speaking out slightly too loudly about the abuses of the dictatorship. And um, and I mean, so in Jakarta, I I interviewed. I mean, I traded emails with the guy that I I believe oversaw this operation and he didn't want to talk about it so he's he's giving he does give interviews now he kind of like he's willing to talk about what patria and libertad was doing back in chile in the 70s and i got i got confirmation from a few of his friends at the time that it was probably him that did it but when i told him what i wanted to talk about he he clammed up he he said uh nobody in chile cares about jakarta and i was like oh well that might be the case but but this is the sort of the you know, it's the title of my book, so it's 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 bringing together these strands. So I am interested in in in, in he, in the interview was off. So I mean, I think it is as chilling as you say it is, and it was so chilling that even the guy who did it, and even though he's kind of proud of his other activities, uh, my my guess is that I I found the guy that did it, and he just didn't, he, 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 that it was it was something that he's he's he doesn't want to be associated with him even though it was too chilling even for for him i think in that regard i guess i i have to ask i i'm assuming that if a national review person read this book they they would cry a foul and say oh vincent bevins is not covering the 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 stalinist purges and blah 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 yeah. blah blah how would you respond to them? Because I think the end of the book gives a pretty good response to why you hone in on this Jakarta method, as you call it. Yeah, well, number one, like, I think I do actually sort of affirm every major crime committed by communist regimes in the 20th century, but they're not the focus of the book. And the reason they're not the focus in the book is, is a couple reasons. One is that the Soviet Union is, is over. It's gone. The very few people defend it, and it has not... It does not um, exercise power over people's lives. 
uh, on the contrary, we live very much in a world created by pro-capitalist violence. We live very much in a world that was shaped by the Jakarta method and shaped by the mass murder programs that I outline in this book. And we have not recognized the extent to which we live in a world shaped by that violence. It's unresolved and forgotten, and if it's not confronted, it will continue to exercise influence over us. And the third issue is just that for the people whose stories that I followed, that, you know, all of the people that are in this book, it just the Soviet Union just was not involved. There was they were not doing any th- crimes, and they were not going to do crimes if 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 the CIA had not taken this path. It just was a very different part of history that was at, not actually relevant to these these stories, but. And I think that the reason that a book needed to be written that highlights this this other side of the coin is because it's still, you know, the very chair that I sit on, you know, is the pro- product of a system shaped by this violence. And it's just the opposite is just not the true, not the case for Stalin. What's interesting, too, with regards to how this book looks at the Cold War, I think most of us look at the Soviet Union's as losers, right? They're the losers of the Cold War, and America are the great winners. But, you know, in a very ironic way, a very tragic way, the real losers of the 20th century are those who believed so strongly in the liberal international order and democracy uh, within this Third World Movement that they had to be annihilated uh, by the very country, uh, well, with the help of the very country, America, the U.S., uh, that claimed to have been for this kind of liberal international order and this kind of strengthening of democracy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union did not fare well after 1989, but I think that I was the one, you know, over the last three years, I think I was hanging out with the real losers of the Cold War. And these are the left-wing movements in the third world that were crushed precisely because they were unarmed they were they were crushed crushed precisely because they thought if they played by the rules everything would be fine and have been thrown fully into the dustbin of history to use that old phrase from the soviet union like the people in indonesia like not only did they lose like they lost the whole they lost the story too they they they're considered the the bad guys it's in in a way, it's a double death, right? Because right. I mean, you have the actual uh, violence, and then you have the complete erasure of the historical memory of that violence. It's sort of it reminds me of the Armenian genocide. Not only do you have this genocide that happened, uh, but to this very day, I mean, there's people who still deny that genocide. I mean, I mean, that in itself is a horror story. Yeah, and this is something that. When I, I was going back and forth between Indonesia and Latin America for these stories, and I would, I would tell the Indonesians about, oh well, in Latin America, this one victim uh, is now involved in politics, and they're like, what? I mean, they're they're allowed to be involved in politics? They're the people in Indonesia are just like shocked that they have in down here in South America, most countries have gone through a reconciliation process process where people have been have received apologies, and the the record has been set straight to say you were not wrong. The dictatorship was wrong. We're going to publish the crimes that were committed by them. In Indonesia, they they were shocked that this was even be possible because they'd given up on this years ago. The the possibility that that anybody would ever recognize what happened to them. In closing, uh, the the last thing I want to ask, and it's sort of a two parter. I hope you can answer it. Is what story stands out the most for you of the people that you spoke to, and also, do you think investigating this what what was the per- personal effect that it had on you? Um, I'm gonna do the second one first, so I can think about the first one. The uh, it was, I feel very like I feel I mean I feel guilty even saying this, but uh, because like what I went through was like like one percent of the people that I met over the last three years, but it was like very it was a very psychologically difficult process, right? Like there was points in which like my kind of sense of self kind of fell apart. I had some like real episodes where it was very hard to hear these stories and hard to re- reconstruct the stories in a way that was faithful. Um, and it made me like sort of just really question the nature of American hegemony, the nature of the global system, the nature of history, nature of human knowledge. Uh, and I'm still like emerging from that process and trying to put together like what, trying to come to, you know, trying to figure out what I really think about the world and what I really think about 
politics in the United States and the global capitalist order? I, I ask that question mainly because uh, I've talked to uh, get Greg Polgrain, who you uh, talked yeah. to for this book, and also uh, Professor Peter Dill Scott, who you reference in the footnotes, and both of them seem to have been very affected by looking into this stuff. It, it's very devastating type stuff. Yeah, no, it was very – it was like a hole I had to kind of climb. I mean – I also went into kind of isolation on purpose because I was, you know, I was living in Indonesia. I was just writing fully by myself, and I had to like move back to London where like my friends live and like learn how to like interact with, you know, and like my first, my first, my first interactions with my friends back in London, they were like, "What are you talking about?" Because I was like, "Oh, nobody in this city does real work. They just like get, have fake jobs so that they can justify receiving the spoils of empire." Uh, and 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 even my friends on the left in London were like, "What are you?" What is this idea? Like, what are you like a like a Maoist third worldist or something? Now I was like, no, 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 no. But like, you don't understand. Uh, like, what do what do these people do? They're just like typing on computers and they get like the the labor of thousands of people in 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 the underdeveloped world. Like, obviously, this is the product of violence and everything, and all this privilege is product of violence. And like, I'm not like I might believe that's true. I might not. But even if it, even if it. Um, whether or not it's true, it's very hard to exist, to keep that thought in your head and also just live in the world at the same time. So I think it, I'm still sort of putting back together what I really think about the nature of the global system. Um, and I guess like the person that I like, you know, I, I guess I kind of made her the hero of the stories. Francisca is the person that affected me the most because she, she was a part, she experienced Japanese occupation. She, fought to expel the Dutch after the end of World War II. She was involved in the Third World Movement, translating a bunch of different languages, um, traveling around the world, trying to like create this 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 work this this movement of journalism by the third world for the third world. Her husband's killed in 1965. She retreats to uh, to Amsterdam with her family. Her husband her husband's not killed in 1965. He's taken he's taken into prison and never comes out. Um, but still, she's 94 years old, and she's, like, fighting every day to, like, set the record straight. Um, she She's, like, reading voraciously to try to understand what happened and to try to get the word out. And, like, she's lived, like, 10 lives, uh, you know, lived, like, lived enough for 10 people uh, uh, where I come from, but still, like, never gave up on this idea of her country being something that she's proud of and uh, uh, getting telling this the truth about what really happened. And even though she's hasn't succeeded yet in 94 years, she keeps going. So I think that was probably the most, uh, the most affecting, the, the most the affecting person. The one that gets me if I could real quick, and then we'll let you go is uh, you had a, one of the heads of the uh, organizations for survivors of the Indonesian violence. And uh, you asked them, well, you know, what about the cold war who won it? And he, he said, you know, the U.S. won, capitalism won. And you, you ask him, well, how? And he just responds, you killed us. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's, it, this is a very difficult read in a lot of ways. But I I think this is one of the most uh, important books to come out this year. I want to mm. thank you for writing it. And uh, if you want, how, how can my listeners get the book? And if there's anything you want to say in regards to, what do you want them to get out of it what do you want readers to get out of it because i know you're not saying that this is the reason that the u.s won the cold war but you view it as it's part, part of, of victory it's it's part of the way it's not the reason that the victory was in a binary sense ours versus theirs but it shaped it was a part of the way the victory happened and it shaped what that victory meant um, so yeah, I mean, you could, they could buy the book, um, anywhere that people normally buy books is great. Uh, if you're in the U S like uh, my personal website, I set up a little page called just at the Jakarta method.com, which has sort of ways you can buy it to avoid Amazon, um, or get it abroad if you like. And, um, I mean, I, I do hope people buy it, not because I'm going to get the money myself. I'm not going to get any more money for this, but if the, like, if, if sales tick in in the system, it, it, it sends a signal to the publishing industry that the book should be taken seriously or translated or pushed by the industry. Um, but really, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to having other people read it and, and seeing what they make of the whole story. Because it is not a story with like – I didn't tell the story so that people would think X. It's not, it's not a story constructed in the service of a moral. It is just what happened, and I'm just as eager 
myself to figure out what it might mean as anybody else that might be reading it. Do you think there's a possibility, I know we talked about Bolsonaro at the beginning, uh, do you think there's a possibility that history uh, could repeat itself? I mean, we've talked about Operation Condor, uh, the Phoenix Program, uh, the massacres in Indonesia. Uh, do you think this kind of violence could happen again? Yeah. I mean, so I don't think that Bolsonaro is probably in the in the in um, a position right now to consolidate that kind of dictatorial control and carry out those kinds of massacres just because he's politically weak at the moment. But it's possible. Well, it could be possible for Bolsonaro. But what I will definitely tell you is that every time that I met a victim, whether it was Brazil or Indonesia or Chile, that experienced this sudden eruption of violence that took their friends or loved ones away from them, they always were operating as if it was impossible. They were always operating as if, quote unquote, those kinds of things don't happen anymore. But obviously, they do. Uh, I don't think the history works the way that we've sort of received an understanding in in the Western liberal liberal world. Like there are there are no there are no lines drawn in the sand where like oh that's over forever and history has ex- advanced past this thing. Anything could happen. And, and the the Fukuyama view of history may not exactly be correct. The end of history. <laughs> well, sir, yeah, certainly the popularly accepted interpretation of whatever that meant is not quite right i like uh there's no line there are no lines in this there's no lines in the sand history does not arc towards anything the the arc of history does not necessarily bend in any way um and like i said i spent the last three years getting to know people that thought it could never happen to them and 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 it's it well thank you again vincent bevins author of the jakarta method for coming on parallax views yeah thank you so much Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you found our conversation with Vincent Bevins, author of The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade, and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World to be extremely informative. I cannot stress enough how important, how significant, I feel that this book is. If you haven't got a copy of the Jakarta Method yet, well, you need to rectify that as soon as possible. I cannot recommend it highly enough. So please, if you can, get a copy of the Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins. You will not be disappointed. This is an extremely worthwhile read if you want to understand history and the moment we are in today, the moment the world is in today. It's a very, very powerful and profound read. As always, let me know what you thought about this edition of Parallax Views by dropping me a line on Twitter at ViewsParallax or by email at ParallaxViewsPod at ProtonMail.com. And of course, if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. Could really use your support. You, the listener, are what keep this show going. So I really need your help. Been trying to push for more subscribers, releasing a lot of bonus content, including video interviews, the week that was current events show, and more. Oh, and hey, you also get archived editions of Parallax Views that are now only available for Patreon supporters. So keep that in mind and please consider supporting me on patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And with that being said, until next time, You've been listening to Parallax Views with J. Parallax Views to Parallax J. Views with J. The way out is not simply to say don't do it, just to prohibit. If nothing else, if we don't do it, others do.
will be doing this like right. So, you know, we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff is a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.